And to few stars be cell lymphoma, there's been a, a number of interesting um, presentations here at EHAR. Um, the Danish um, group looked at their registry of patients treated with DLBCL, and they looked at their long-term outcomes of patients who had achieved a CR or a CRU. And when they compared that to a matched population, normal co cohort population. And they demonstrated that in patients under the age of 50, um, if they remain in remission for two years, then they have the same overall survival as the normal population. For those patients who are over 50, there remains a gap in, in overall survival compared with the normal population, suggesting that there's still some ongoing effects perhaps of their, their diagnosis or treatment. But I think what it does send to us as a clear message is that those patients who, have, who are younger, who have been successfully treated, we can keep them in our clinics in terms of follow-up and surveillance for recurrence for the first two years. And I think it's entirely justifiable that we're able to d discharge patients after a period of two years because their overall survival returns to that of the normal population. I think when we do that we have to give, obviously give the patients access into us and so they can contact us if they're worried about anything but I, I, I think it's entirely reasonable based upon that data to say that we should be discharging patients two years after completion of therapy. So that's really important from the patient perspective. Um, interestingly, um, the Dutch group um, presented a very nice phase three study looking at optimizing the use of rituximab in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. I think we you know we've got this schedule of giving one dose of rituximab before every cycle of CHOP chemotherapy. Um, and probably if you look at the pharmacokinetics of rituximab clearance and you look at rituximab levels, that's probably not the optimal way to do that. So what the Dutch group is, did is they, they took um, extra doses of rituximab, uh, four extra doses given within the first four cycles of the therapy. So they had a group of patients who were having augmented rituximab, so they achieved higher plasma rituximab levels, and they had a control group of conventionally treated RCHOP chemotherapy patients. So in this randomized phase three study, it was 570 patients. Interestingly, the metabolic complete response rate and the progression-free survival of the two groups was identical. So although pharmacokinetically we may not have the optimal rituximab schedule, actually clinically that doesn't matter and we haven't, we haven't disadvantaged patients because we haven't fully understood, understood that. Um, there's also some um, interesting data from a collaborative group, the soccer group, looking at patients with relapsed uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and trying to use a combination of clinical parameters and um, immunohistochemical and expression profiling um, uh, markers, putting all of that together to try and find a model to predict um, outcomes. And this was presented by Christian Gieselbrecht uh, on behalf of the consortium. And, and what this demonstrates is that you can use a combination of these. Particularly powerful was the immunohistochemical staining for MYC and BCL2, but also the familiar clinical parameters, really to, to find groups of patients who are going to do particularly poorly from uh, ther conventional therapies for recurrent diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And these are the group of patients who have a huge unmet need, and these are particularly the group of patients where we need to target novel agents.